you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to share a burden on my heart. A um, message like this is something that happens over time. This isn't something that um, you just wake up one day and, and you know, it's there. Um, this is something that, that I'm going to share that um, literally is progressive, um, kind of the burden on my heart. And uh, I'm going to share this morning the challenges of the culture, the challenges. We as the people of God have some unique challenges living in the United States in, in the year of 2019. Uh, there are some challenges that you and I will face um, that they didn't face 50 years ago. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not that, you know, that temptation's different. It's not that, um, you know, that God has changed. It's not that the enemy has changed. Uh, but the culture has changed. Uh, things um, in our culture, let me just say this, that our culture is not moving closer to God. Okay? And so because of that, there are some challenges that you and I are going to face. And, and a lot of this, some of this is, I wouldn't say a lot, some of this is my challenge. Um, some of this is things that I struggle with. So I'll be candid this morning, and I'll be open with you and share some of the challenges that I'm facing in this culture um, that, that I'm struggling with. But what I want you to see from the Word of God is that we're not alone. Sometimes we can think, man, it, we're living in the most difficult times and the most challenging times that there's ever been, and, and, and we're, you know, nobody's ever faced times like we have, and it doesn't take you very long to look to the Word of God and find out that's not true, okay? And so I'm going to uh, share with you this morning uh, from Daniel chapter 3. So if you find your place, would you shout a big amen in Daniel chapter 3? If you said amen, even if you didn't, would you stand as we give reverence? Uh, to the Word of God, Daniel chapter 3, verse number 1 says this, Now ne King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits in breadth, 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So let me stop there. So the, the historical setting that's taking place is important for us to understand. Okay, so uh, the Babylonian exile, because of the judgment of God, God allowed the nation of Israel to be captured by the Babylonian Empire. Okay, and so what had happened is, is uh, Bab the, the Babylonians came in and they captured Israel, they ransacked them, and, and, and basically carried them away into the far country, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of details that I don't have time because I want to get into the message this morning, but... The, uh, the Jews were living in a very difficult place at this time, okay? They were in a foreign land. Um, they, they were not in Jerusalem. And God had not changed, but everything around them had changed, okay? Begin to think about that. Their God was the same, but now here they are in Babylonian exile, and everything around them is different. And so now it says Nebuchadnezzar made this image of gold, his height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then, ne then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the perfects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that ne King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps and the perfects and the governors and the counselors and treasurers and the justices, magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had stood up, set up. And, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nation and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. So the government intervened. The government stepped in. You can say what you want about our government, but our government has not commanded us to worship any god. Is our government pro-god? I 
you know, that, that's not for me to say, but I'm just saying that what we have right now is not as bad as what it is here. You with me? And sometimes we can feel like, man, we've got it so bad, and it, it, it's, it's the worst uh, culture that we've ever been in. No, there's a command here that, that even if you didn't believe that you were, once you heard these noises, that you were to fall down and you were to worship the gods that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 6, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pyre, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people's nations and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at a certain time, the Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. What a declaration. What a faith-filled declaration. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... But if not, God is still God. Amen? Notice this. Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And the rest of the story, we already know what happens. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace. The fourth man was in the fire as the Son of God protecting them in the fire. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we love you this morning. God, we're grateful for the opportunity to read your word. And, and Father, as we begin to uh, look um, at this text, God, we begin to see that we can somewhat identify in the culture that we're living in. And Lord, I ask you to speak to us this morning. And God, that you would challenge us. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, do what only you can in us. God, I pray that you would raise up courage inside of us to live for you and to serve you, mighty God. And, and Lord, in the midst of these unique challenges we are facing in the United States of America in the year 2019, uh, Lord, that you would just uh, allow us to be the people of God, to shine your light, to be salt in the midst of this world. Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for what's done. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. How many would agree this morning that the three Hebrew children in Daniel chapter 3 were outnumbered and they faced many challenges as a result. They were not the majority in the land. As a matter of fact, they were isolated. They were just but a few. But the reality is, is because they were outnumbered, because that there was more of them than there was of, uh, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they faced some challenges. They face some pressure. They face some adversity, so to speak. And as we look around us today in the United States, 2019, it is evident to see we are outnumbered. As the people of God, we are living in a post-Christian culture. What does that mean? You say, well, what do you mean that we're living in a post-Christian culture? Well, the majority of people in the United States of America do not have a biblical worldview. They do not believe that the Word of God is the final uh, source of authority for faith and practice. 
Okay? And so the reality is there was a time in this country that our country was considered a Christian nation. Uh, that, that means the majority would have at least professed, not necessarily were, but would have at least professed to have a biblical worldview and, and, and place faith in the God of heaven. Those days are long gone. It's over. Okay? And so uh, because of that, we face some unique challenges. And I don't know how it is for you, but let me just be candid with myself this morning. But for me as a Christ follower, it is becoming very, very difficult for me to watch what is happening in our culture, for me to watch the news and stay encouraged and have a Christ-like attitude. I find it difficult to be encouraged, and I find it difficult. I, honestly, I find myself getting in the flesh watching the news more than I find myself having a Christ-like attitude. I'm seeing all these things that are happening, and just this last week, there were some things that took place in our headlines that had me scratching my head, and, and, and honestly, I was finding myself getting angry. That's not good. I'm facing challenges, and, and, and some of you, maybe you can... And I don't even have to read the headlines. I'm sure some of you, if you're paying attention, you see the things that are happening. Listen, that would have never in a million years happened in the United States of America 50 years ago. Couldn't even have dreamed of it. I mean, if you would have said this was happening, people would have said, you're crazy, you've lost your mind, we're going to put you in a mental hospital, and we're going to throw away the key. We're going to lock you up and throw away the key. That will never happen in this Christian country. But the reality is it is happening. And our culture is changing, whether we agree with it or whether we don't. And, and, and as a result of the culture changing so quickly around us, you and I as Christ followers, as Bible believers, are going to face some challenges in these days. I'm not discrediting God. God can bring revival to America. God can, it can bring a great awakening uh, to this country. I'm not counting God out I believe that I'll pray for it I'll continue to believe that God can do it but according to the scripture the Bible teaches us the closer that we get to the end the love of many is going to wax cold so what we find is that we don't find cultures that are drifting towards God according to the Bible we find cultures that are drifting away from God as the end comes and that is where that we are at and so some of my struggles let me just talk about me and my difficulties and how that I haven't arrived. Is facing these issues, these differences in the spirit and not in the flesh. And so as we begin to think about our culture and as we begin to think about the, the way things are moving away from God, here are some of the unique challenges, and I, I want to share them with you this morning, that we are going to have to face as the people of God. Number one, we're going to have to continue to place the scripture over our feelings. This is a challenge. This is not easy. This is, this is something that's difficult. And we are living in an era of compromise, and this is where it begins, is that people no longer have a high view of Scripture. They now start basing truth on what they feel. Why well, feel this way, so this must be true. The Word of God is our final source for authority of faith and practice. Okay, and so this is, the word of God is what is true. The scripture is what is true. And, and look, in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus speaking about the disciples, he said, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. This is going to be a unique challenge that we are facing in our culture as people are, are moving farther and farther away from God. They're letting their feelings determine what is true in the culture, what is true in their life. And if you begin to, to, to say something else uh, to them, they'll say, but that's not the way I feel. That can't be right because it doesn't feel right. This is what feels right. And, 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 and I don't want to... Uh, uh, be argumentative with you this morning I don't, I don't want to be confrontational with you this morning but nowhere in the scripture do we ever find that we are to base what is true on the basis of our feelings and we have to be very very careful because in our culture what happens is the majority of people they're basing their philosophy of truth on the basis of their opinions and what they feel to be true in the book of Judges 
uh, in, in the, the nation of Israel, in the history of the nation of Israel, chaos controlled the culture for this very reason. Because people were being led by their feelings. They were trying to determine what is true by what they felt. And the scripture says this in Judges 17, 6, 6. In those days there was no king over Israel. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. So this person is determining what's true for them. This person is determining what's true for them. Then this person over here is determining what's true for them. Everyone was doing right in their own eyes based on what they felt, based on their opinions, and chaos ensued. That's where we're at. As you begin to look around and as you begin to talk to people about their views uh, 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 of truth, you begin to find that it's very relative. You, you begin to find that, that what's right for you is not necessarily right for me. What's wrong for you is not necessarily wrong for me. But we also know that the Word of God teaches us in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. So there are a lot of people that think that what they believe is true and what they think is right based on the basis of their feelings but scripture says the end of that way of thinking is death, right? So as believers, as the culture is moving farther and farther away from God, this is going to be a challenge that I'm going to uphold what the scripture says to be truth, irregardless of how I feel. If God says that it's sin, it's sin. No matter how I feel, no matter if it affects my family, no, long, no matter if it affects my children, no matter if it affects my finances, it doesn't matter if it affects my church or my friends. If God says it's wrong, church, it's wrong. And I have to be honest with you, even in my flesh sometimes, that bothers me. I don't always agree with it, but guess what? Even whenever I don't agree, God's word is right and I'm the one that's wrong. And I have a challenge, and you have a challenge, especially as we're moving farther and farther away from God. Either we're going to have a high view of Scripture or we're going to cave to compromise. There is no middle ground. And what we're seeing, and it's happening fast, is that we're seeing people that used to have a high view of Scripture, that, that used to believe that the Word of God was inerrant, infallible, that there are, no, there are no errors in the Word of God, that now are compromising what they believe about truth. And now we're seeing churches that one time believed that the word of God was infallible, the word of God was inerrant, and now they've came to compromise. And now we're seeing entire denominations that used to really believe that the word of God was our source of truth, that God has determined what is true and what is not true, and entire denominations have fallen into compromise. Why? Because it's easy in our culture. That's why. Listen, we're not in this for a popularity contest, church. This is not about trying to be popular. This is about pleasing God and, and, and having a desire to please God. And, and so we must decide what is the basis of truth. Who decides what is true? And the scripture alone decides what is true. And, and, and there is such a dangerous now, this is the pathway to compromise that we begin to place our feelings over Scripture as the basis of truth. And, you know, uh, some people, you know, they say things like this. Well, I know that that's what the Bible says, but I feel that God's okay with this. You know, that's a dangerous statement. That's, that's really where it begins. Is yeah, okay, the Bible does say that, but this is what I feel. And I feel that this should be right, and because my feelings are telling me this, Scripture must be wrong and my feelings must be right. Such a danger with that. We have to be very, very careful that we are not caving into compromise in our culture. Can you imagine what would have happened if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was basing their truth on their feelings rather than on what they knew to be true? They would have caved to compromise. You know what they would have done? If it was just based on their feelings, everybody else around them is doing it. And so when they heard the sounds, listen, if it was all about their feelings, they would have fell down and worship too, right? But then they would have never seen God showed up. They would have never seen the, the, the fourth man in the fire, and God would have not been glorified in the end. Well, I know what, that's what the Bible says, but I think God understands why I believe something differently. I think God understands my view 
being different than what the scripture teaches. Well, I know what the Bible says, but me and God have this deal worked out. You hear people say that. Me and God, yeah. Listen, everybody look right up here. God has one deal worked out with humanity, and it's at the cross of Jesus Christ. And here's the great thing, the deal still is offered to you. The deal is still offered to all humanity. God made a deal with us when he went to the cross, right? So this idea of having God having special deals with people, that's becoming more and more prevalent. It's becoming more and more popular. And, and, and we have a challenge before us to make sure that, that we are uh, placing the word of God as authoritative. It's final. This is the source of truth. If it contradicts, if my views, if my feelings contradict what the scripture says, my views and my feelings are wrong. God is not wrong. And I just have to be honest with you, that's not easy. It's not easy, especially when we have family that, that maybe that, that, that they're, they're involved in, in lifestyles that are contrary to what the Word of God says. Now, do we continue to love our family? Absolutely. And that's part of our, the next part of our message, where I think the church is, is, is failing in our challenge as well. That, that we're not doing a great job universally as a church um, loving those that we disagree with. Right? Don't we have a command from God for that? We do. But, but the first thing that we must understand that there is a challenge is, is this idea that our feelings do not determine what is true. Either the scripture determines what is true or it doesn't. And so th this is part of the reformation that, that we believe that, that it's the scripture alone that reveals what is true. That God has made a revelation to mankind and it's through his word. If you believe it, say amen. Our feelings are deceptive. Our feelings will change. I might feel one way in the morning. I might feel a completely different way at night. But guess what? The Word of God never changes. The Word of God never changes. Heaven and earth will surely pass away, but none of my word saith the Lord. So one of the challenges that we're going to face is this, as we continue, as the culture um, continues to move farther and farther away from God, I, I, I just have to say in Daniel chapter 3, it was a hostile culture. Um, our culture is not necessarily hostile against Christians, against the faith, but it sure is moving that way. I mean, there, there are talks in, in, in presidential campaigns of, of, uh, of moving that way. If you've been paying attention, if you've been watching it all, there are some, some, some views and there are some things that have been vocalized that, that, that are very, very similar to what we find in Daniel chapter 3. And so the question is, are we going to place the scripture over our feelings? If we do not, that is the pathway to compromise. That is the one way that you can be sure that you will compromise what is true and that you will cave in and, and, and that you will eventually be led away from God is the simply being led by your feelings. Well, this is what I think, this is what I feel, and so because I feel this way, it must be true. The word of God is the final uh, truth for mankind. If you believe it, say amen this morning. Second thing, second challenge. Let's become a little more practical in the church um, with this. Is that we must place importance of the message over the method. We must place the importance of the message over the method. In 1 Corinthians, turn with me in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. The Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinth church and, and explaining to them um, the importance of reaching people for Christ, people that are different from you. And this, is, this was the way that the Apostle Paul did that. In 1 Corinthians 9, 22, he said, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. So Paul, he became a Jew to the Jews, a Gentile to the Gentiles. Why? So that he could win some to the Lord. So notice this, his message never changed, but the way he delivered that message was different. Do you get that? So there was change that was taking place in methods, but the message was remaining the same. 
Listen, everybody look right up here. If the church is going to survive in this post-Christian culture, we're going to have to be willing to not compromise the message, but must be willing to change some of our methods. If we're going to continue to be cutting edge, if we're going to continue to reach people, we're going to have to be willing to change some of the ways that we reach people, but never change the message of the gospel, right? Because the message of the gospel is... Like Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation. It's that death, burial, and resurrection that convicts people of sin and brings them to Christ, right? So the message of the gospel never changes, but sometimes the way we do ministry needs to change. See, churches are, are closing all over America because they believe the method is more important than the message. Now, they would never vocalize that. They would never verbalize that. They would never say that to your face. They wouldn't tell you that directly, but it's true in their practice, right? They say things like this, well, we've never done it that way. This is the way that we've always done it. Can I tell you this is the way we've always done it? That works really well if it's working, right? If the way we've always done something is working, let's keep doing it, right? There's no need to stop doing something that's working. I mean, man, if, if God's given you an opportunity in, in ministry and ministry and you're reaching people for the Lord and, and, and people are being saved and people are growing, there's no reason to change that method. But, but here's the thing. There are some churches in our culture that they're still doing ministry the way they did 75 years ago and there's four people showing up in auditoriums of 600-seat auditoriums and they wonder why they're dying. Well, we're not going to change anything because this is the way that we've always done it. We don't change the message. We, sometimes we have to change the method, right? And that's what, this is what Paul, this is what Paul was saying is whenever I came to the Jews, I became a Jew. I became like a Jew to them so that I could win them to Christ. But when I was with the Gentiles, I did ministry a different way. I talked to them differently, right? So let me just share with you uh, how this becomes practical and, and, and the, the reasons why um, this is important and, and, and kind of also a, a theological base. You know, one of the interesting marks of Jesus in his ministry is that he, he didn't really ever do his miracles the same way. Think about the lepers. We, we find multiple lepers that Jesus healed and cleansed in the scripture. In Mark chapter 1, he touched a leper, which is lepers are unclean and no one would ever touch them, but Jesus was the son of God. He was the one that had power and could heal them. And so in Mark chapter 1, he touches the leper and immediately that leper see is clean. They, they begin to, to, to proclaim it through Galilee and, and shouting and praising the Lord because it was incurable. It's like there was no cure and to think that Jesus touched them and he was clean and so he probably spread it throughout the region and in Luke chapter 17 Jesus comes up to 10 lepers. Right? They're quarantined and these lepers are saying, have mercy upon us son of David and, and we, we, if you will just touch us we will be clean. But notice what Jesus says to them. Go show yourselves unto the priests and you will be clean. You know what? He didn't touch them. And the Bible says that as they went, they were healed. They were never touched by Jesus. Because Jesus didn't want their faith to be in the method. He wanted their faith to be in him. And what he could do. See, it wasn't in the basis of his touch. It was, it, it was in who he was and what he said. All Jesus had to do was to speak the word and it would be done. And so as you begin to see this and how this implies is we have some church planters over in Hawaii. What we're doing this morning is not going to work in Hawaii. Okay? Nothing wrong. We're going to keep doing ministry the way we're doing ministry this morning. Why? Because it works. Right? Because God is using it. Because we're in, the, we're in a, the Bible Belt, right? You guys understand that uh, we are fortunate um, as evangelical Christians to be living in the Bible Belt. You go to New York City and try to bring people together like we're bringing people together here, few and far between. You try to go out to Seattle, Washington and do this, man, you, you talk about people that are hardened to the gospel, man, they, they, they just, it, it's difficult. And so what the church has to do we don't need to change things that are working well here, right? But people in New York City, people in Seattle, people in Hawaii, what they have to do is if they've come from a background like you and I are experiencing today, they've got to be willing to change their method if they're going to reach people. Same gospel, but they're going to have to reach people in a different way. 
Just like the Apostle Paul, he came, to the Jew, he became a Jew. To the Gentile, he became a Gentile. He changed the way he did ministry, but the gospel remained the same. And as I'm, it, it, it's something God's been just showing me and, and, and showing me deep down into my spirit. The farther and farther that we get away, that our culture moves away from God, the more important relationships are going to be. More important relationships are going to be. Because I, I'll be honest with you, you know what, what, what people in the United States of America are, are tired of? They're tired of churches splitting over funny stuff. They're tired of pastors falling into sexual immorality and, and getting out of the ministry. They're tired of the fake, they're tired of the phony, and guess what? People don't even want to walk into church anymore. It's tough. When you invite somebody to church, they don't even want to cope. They're skeptical because... A lot of church people are phony, they're fake, and, and, and man, I can sit home and watch TV, and, and I can listen to a sermon on bot radio, and, 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 but the reality is it's not the same, right? We know that the ecclesia is the called out people of God that gather corporately. This is how we serve one another in our spiritual gifts, but that's the mindset of the culture. And so, one of the things that's going to be really, really important as we're moving farther and farther away is deepening relationships with people that do not know God in order to help them to come to know God. And what we have to be real careful of is in church, our philosophy is our holy huddles. You know, we get, we get together and it's like, man, we get all excited in our uh, gathering on Sunday morning and Man, we're amped up and we're pumped up and the next thing you know, we come back and we do it again Sunday morning. Yeah, we're excited and man, we heard some good music and man, I got motivated by the pastor and but you know what? We're never talking to anybody during the week about what God's doing. We're not building any relationships. We're not being that lifeline. We're not being that 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 vessel that God wants to use to bring somebody to know him, right? And so there was a time in the United States of America in the culture that it was very, very common for people to drive by a church and to think, man, I'd like to do this. just go, go try that church. Or somebody to be walking down the street and to look up at the church building and think, man, I ought to go in and check that place out. Those days are over. People don't drive by churches anymore and think, man, that, I wonder what it's like in there. People don't walk by the church because the level of respect has diminished in our culture right? So the idea of church, what, what needs to become important is the relationships that are, that are found within the body, right? Because the building is not the church, right? Help me, stay with me this morning. We are the ecclesia, we're the, we're the, the, the corporate, we're the gathering of the people of God, and so it's the relationships, and that's what is important. As the culture is moving farther and farther away from God, we're going to be challenged to build relationships and be reaching out with people and loving people and, 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 and helping people and, and giving to people and doing good things for our culture and for our society and, and, and having a good reputation among the culture. Quite frankly, and, and, and just because of uh, of, of a lot of things that have happened, as I've said, church splits and, and, and pastors falling into uh, sin and, and all these different things. You know what? The word church doesn't have a good reputation in our culture anymore. It just doesn't. There was a time when, even a pastor, there was a time when, when you talked about somebody being a pastor that it meant something. This was a, it was an honorable position. In the culture today, Man, it, it doesn't mean as much. Why? Because on the news, you find out things like pastors are being caught in sex things. Well, it doesn't mean anything. If a pastor's doing that, he's worse off than the regular guy, and so his position must not be honorable. He, he, he must not be really walking with God. You see the challenges of our culture? Are you following with me in, in the importance of why we're going to have to make sure that the, the message never changes, but we're going to be willing to do things differently in the methods to reach people? Because if not, churches are going to fall statistic as they say that 1,200 churches a month in the United States of America are closing their doors. Wrap your mind around that. 
wrath. Thank God for what we have this morning. Thank God that we're able to pay our light bills. Thank God that we're able to do some things for our community. Thank God that we're able to give a free meal on Wednesday nights to the kids in Awana and, and to show our love for this community that we're not just here preaching a message. We're trying to be the hands and feet of Christ. Thank God that it's happening here at Cross Point. But church, it's not happening everywhere. It's not. So this message goes far beyond just these walls this morning. That, that, that we have some unique challenges that are ahead of us and we've got to make sure that the message is more important than the method. If you believe it, shout a big amen. amen. Last but not least, we got to make sure that we emphasize love over hate. This is so, so important. Listen, there are going to be things that we disagree with others on, but that does not mean that we hate them. Just because we have a difference of views does not give us permission. By the way, if your religion gives you permission to hate someone, you need to change your religion for salvation. Because when you get salvation, you love people. It doesn't matter what they're involved in. It doesn't matter what their lifestyle is. We never, our, our salvation never gives us permission to hate anybody. Ever. And what has is, what is God called us to do? To bring a world to him, right? Isn't that our mission to evangelize and disciple? And can I just tell you that being hateful will never bring anybody to God? Being hateful, being angry will never bring anybody to God. Being bitter, you know, and, and, and listen, we're, we're living in the most opinionated culture. It's like, Man, everybody's got an opinion about everything. And sometimes the way that we express our opinions aren't very Christ-like. You know what? That, that's not going to do anything for the kingdom of God. If we can't express the, 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 the truth of the gospel in a loving way, we are going to hinder, not help, the work that God's called us to do. So to begin to think about it, begin to think about, are we truly loving the people that we disagree with? Even the people... Once again, so we don't compromise, right, because we place scripture over our feelings. But are we really loving people that are different from us? People that have a different theological view. People that have a different philosophical view of truth. People that have a different practical view. People that have a different religious view. I think we have to step back and ask ourselves, are we really loving those people? What does that love look like? See, love is not compromising and accepting their way is true. That's not, that, that's not biblical. Jesus didn't do that. When the woman came to Jesus that was caught in the sin of adultery, you know what Jesus did? He told that woman, he dealt with the sin. He says, go and sin no more. He didn't compromise. He didn't say, oh, he didn't pat her on the back and say, oh, just go back and, and, and keep living in adultery. No, he loved that woman. He says, woman, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. Go and do different. There's something better for you, woman. There, there, you can live for me, and you can have an abundant life. And so you, loving people doesn't mean that you just cave in, and you just compromise, and you accept their feeling as the source of truth. We can still maintain what the scripture says as the source of truth and love people at the same time. I mean genuinely love people. Not in a fake or a phony way, but invite people over to the house. Asking them out, taking them out for dinner, buying nice gifts for them, doing kind gestures that they can see that, you know what, these people even understand that I view life differently than they do, but they can't explain how I can still love them even though I view life differently than them. And the majority of the culture thinks the opposite of Christians. I'm just telling you how it is. The majority of the, the world thinks that if we disagree with them, we hate them. Is that scriptural? How do we change it? Church, how do we change it? Honestly, ask yourself, how, do we, how are we going to do it? Is, is it? is it a problem with us? Is it deep within our heart? Is it, is it, does God need to do something within us as believers is there something practical that we can do better for people that disagree with us to prove you know what I don't agree with you and you know that I don't agree with you but I'm gonna love you unconditionally and I'm not gonna treat you any differently because we have different views right 
we've got, we have to do better. The church, as the culture is moving farther and farther away, the church is going to have to do better. It's just going to have to because it, it's going to take a toll on what God is doing uh, in, in our culture and, and, and specifically what God is doing in his kingdom. And so this is, this is really where the rubber meets the road. Do we compromise what we believe is truth? No. But do we love those that we disagree with? Yes. Absolutely, emphatically, yes. Why? Because that's what the scripture teaches. Look what Romans, or I'm sorry, 1 John, go with me, go with me. 1 John, chapter number 4. Man, I, 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 I told you I'd share my struggle. I, I struggle with this. This is something that I haven't arrived on. I hope that you'll pray for me. I'm passionate about what I believe. I just am. I, I, with every fiber that's within me, I believe what I'm reading to you. If I didn't believe this, I'd go work a secular job where I could make twice as much money. I have the education to do it. I could do it. There, there'd be no problem. I am passionate about what I believe. And sometimes when you're passionate about something, that can come across as unloving. Right? It's like, man, I need prayer on this. You guys pray for me. We pray for one another that we can do better at this, right? So listen, listen to what, what the, 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 the epistle tells us in 1 John chapter 4. This is the mark of the people of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we so also so should love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Man, you get this picture of that God is love and God has lavished his love on us and God has poured out his love on us and it's the idea that, that we are just pouring out his love on everyone else. And do we pick and choose who we get to pour that love out on according to the scripture? Are there any conditions according to the scripture of, okay, well you love this person a lot because they love you. You love this person somewhat because they're not quite like you but they're not totally against you and and just be rude, just be arrogant, be difficult with this person because they don't believe anything like you. Is that what the scripture teaches us? So how are we, here's the question that we have to ask ourselves, as believers who are holding the scripture above what we feel, right, how are we showing the world and those that view differently from us that we actually love them? What are we doing in a practical sense? What is a way, because our message, let me just say this, our message will never come across as love. When I was saved, I was confronted by my sin. I didn't like it. God convicted me. I was, I was angry that day because God showed me what a sinner I was. And the Bible teaches us that we all love our sin, right? But God convicted me, and, and I didn't like it that day. And had I not been confronted with the gospel, I wouldn't be saved today. So there is a level of confrontation with our message. But that doesn't mean us as messengers have to be confrontational. And we don't have to be unloving to people. Even though the message stings, that mean, it doesn't mean that we have to sting people. Amen? So I think our challenge, one of the challenges in the culture, is that we find ourselves a place to pray and say, God, help us to love people that will draw people to you. Because if we're sharing a message of confrontation, as long as we're loving people, it doesn't sting near as bad. Right? But if we're coming across as hateful, if we're coming across as arrogant, if we're coming across and, and you know, kind of bullyish, some ways that we do, we, we kind of become church bullies. Well, yeah, you, you have to believe this, and, and if you don't, then, then, then you're not right with God, and, and Man, we're never going to bring anybody to the Lord. It's just not going to happen, and it's a challenge in our culture, right? Uphold the Scripture. Have a high view of Scripture. 
And if you're here this morning and, and, and you've somehow slipped and allowed your feelings to start dictating what is true in your life, my prayer for you is that you will find a place to pray and that you will place the scripture as the highest view that you can this morning. Because absolute truth is determined by God and God alone. And God's truth should never be compromised in any situation. Under any circumstance for any person. God's truth is truth, irregardless of how we feel or what it looks like. Amen? And that love should always mark the believer. John 13, if the music team would go ahead and come, I'm done. John 13, 35, this is the way. By this will all men know that you're my disciples. This is what Jesus said. I, it's not what I'm saying. It's like, man, we love to hit, you know, strong messages and we love to, to capitalize on verses and to really push verses onto people but here's one for you this is the way that people are going to know that you belong to God if you love people that's what Jesus said on the way to the cross Jesus said they're going to know you not because of how much Bible that you know not because of the way that you can talk not because of your religious affiliation they're going to know that you belong to God because you love one another and the Sermon on the Mount man this this just convicts me honest being open and honest again this convicts me Jesus says it's easy to love those that love you what about those that persecute you what about those that despise you what about those that you disagree with theologically how you doing in that camp how you loving them because even the Pharisees man this just cuts this cuts deep. Even the Pharisees love those that love them. But you're different than the Pharisees because you have the Spirit of God. Ouch. Oh me. Lord help. That we as the people of God will maintain that high view of Scripture, but we will be known as the people who love God and love people irregardless of the way they believe and irregardless of the way that they act. Amen. Let's bow for prayer.